Kazuo Ishiguro's book, The Remains of the Day, won Britain's top literary award, the Booker Prize. It received rave reviews from the critics and was turned into an award-winning film starring Anthony Hopkins. Born in Japan, but raised in London from the time of his childhood, Ishiguro began a career as a social worker before writing his first book. His fourth novel, The Unconsoled, examines the mixed blessings of celebrity from the point of view of a celebrated pianist as he readies for a concert. I'm very pleased to have Kazuo Ishiguro on this program uh, this evening. Welcome. Great to have you here. Oh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, you know, do you read reviews? Uh, sometimes, oh. yeah. Well, of course, yes, I do, yes. When I, whenever I can find them, yes. Yeah. Uh, they are pra praising this book, but there also seem to be, some of the words that come out are, are puzzled and frustrated. It's difficult. What's in your head as you're writing this? I mean, do you mean to be difficult? Do you mean to be uncompromising for the reader? Do you mean to be what? I don't mean deliberately to be difficult. You know, I think it's just bad manners to, to you know, just deliberately be difficult. If you're talking to somebody, you have to try and say things as clearly as possible. But having said that, um, if what you're trying to say uh, requires a certain odd way of saying it, then, well, that, you know, that's the best you can do. And uh, I, I, I think it's fair that you know, these reviews, if you like, warn people who perhaps... Don't expect an easy read. Yeah, yeah, it's not an easy read. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't take it to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> but describe the book in your own terms. You know? Well, it's essentially a book. Well, I guess one of the reasons it's not an easy read is because it's 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 kind of involved with anxiety. It's it's some people have said it's like a, a long anxiety yeah. dream. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I am fascinated by this idea of an anxiety dream, uh, particularly like an anxiety about a performance that is coming up. You know, I, I kind of feel that many of us are going through life with a sense that some at some point there is this very important performance that's coming up. We're going to get pushed up there on the stage and all these people are going to judge us and we should be preparing for it but in the meantime there are all these things to be getting on in life and you have to look after the kids and do the shopping and, and every now and again you stop and you realize you're not ready. Um, I get this performance feel anxiety every night. Well you're this in time. a special position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but go ahead. This is a question of a concert pianist and, but it is the idea of anxiety about being on stage. Well, it's, I guess it's my kind of version Not on of stage so much, but on stage as a metaphor for yeah. important events in your life. I suppose it's for the, it's the anxiety about the important event in, in your life. I mean, it, it may just be my version of the old kind of judgment day idea, that you know, yeah. there is some point to which all our lives are consciously or unconsciously moving. And at some point, we're going to have to give an account of what we've been doing. But I'm not a religious person myself, and um, maybe I find it easier to use metaphors like performance anxiety, that we're all moving towards this big yeah. performance. This is such an easy question to ask, but I mean, there's a sense that, you know, is there any of Ishiguro in Ryder? Is, are you here in Ryder, the pianist, the principal character? Well, uh, only in a, in a very glancing sense. Uh, I find it very difficult to write about any character unless it is in some sense based on some aspect of myself. And, uh, uh, and I suppose, I mean, this is rather a disturbing thing, but I, I can only really work up an interest in characters who, who come out of the less attractive aspects of myself. But that's not to say, you know, I don't write in that kind of autobiographical mode. And uh, certainly this isn't a book about me. Or he's a concert pianist, I'm an author. But I mean, that's not well, what's the unattractive something. aspect of you that's in him? Well, that character, rather like the, the character in my last book, The Remains of the Day, I mean, finds it very difficult to, to give himself to other people, to open up his emotions. Uh, he's, he's defensive to the, to the point of, um, I, I think, you know, almost being not human. But at the same not time... Not human. Well, yes. I mean, there comes a point when, uh, well, uh, as with both of these characters, I think you know, the, the, an obsession with control and um, restraint perhaps uh, uh, takes these people over the line into, into being people who are quite destructive. Does writing about it make you less that way? Examining it and writing about it? I don't know. I don't, I, I, it probably doesn't. I mean, I, I don't think um, there is a practical value in, in this sense. Well, how about know? a cathartic value? There, there might be a kind of cathartic value. I think, I think um, a lot of writers like to write about certain areas 
that touch on maybe some kind of um, misalignment, some kind of wound deep in themselves. And this, this isn't because there's a practical uh, benefit from doing so. It's just that if you know you've got some kind of messy wound somewhere that's never going to heal, you still want to kind of play about with it. And, and I think many writers move towards certain themes, certain ideas uh, for that reason. Tell me about the relationship between Sophie and Boris to writer. Well, this is one of the odd things about the book. Um, at first, they're just strangers he encounters in the city. But gradually, he, he starts to get vague memories about them. And he starts to think, well, maybe they're not strangers. Maybe you know, Sophie is, in fact, my wife. Maybe Boris is my son. And, and they certainly behave towards him as though he is you know, the father stroke husband. And so, so he, he accepts this and goes along with it. Um, I mean, this, this points to one of the ways in, odd ways in which the book works. Uh, it's not like a conventional story where you hear about somebody's life from you know, youth to old age. Rather, you have a model where a protagonist walks into some kind of strange world, and he bumps into people who are, who are aspects of himself from the past or aspects of important relationships he's had. There's a familiarity yeah. and an unreality about yeah. his experience and unknowingness. Well, it, rather, rather in the way dreams are yeah, sometimes, right. maybe, that you know, you, you, it's peopled by people from the past. Did you, I mean, I want to ask you about this, did, did, did you have anything, to, you didn't have anything, to, we talked about this before, so when I sat down with you, you didn't have anything to do with the selection of this cover. This no, is a John I didn't. Bowman photo, I mean, a painting. Mm -hmm. No, but I, I, th I think you it's like a fine it? cover, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, it was just selected by the publishers, I guess, right? Yes, it was, but yeah. the, um, the colors are rather good. The, the, the colors. Oh, oh, the colors. Yeah. yeah. You have in your life been, uh, uh, in a sense, when you go to Japan, you didn't go until you were, what, 30 in your 30s? I was 35 when I returned to Japan yeah. for the first time. And you left time. it when you were, what? Five. Five. And mm. so 30 years later, you go back. Mm. And because you'd had some success, you were instantly viewed as an authority on Japan. Yes, particularly in Britain, in the West, I was. I mean, not in Japan. No, but um, in the West. I mean, you were wanted asked to comment on all things Japan. Yeah, this is this is a this is a problem in, in England, Japanese. and maybe it, it happens here. I don't know. Perhaps people are slightly more sophisticated. But because somebody has a Japanese face, and um, there is this, this assumption that um, yes, you can comment on anything to do with Japan and from indeed, culture to commerce. Yeah. <laughs> well, indeed, I was. You know, I, I had to turn down the most ridiculous requests, like to comment on the, the trade relations between the U.S. and Japan, and so yeah. on. And, and why would I know about that? I mean, it's rather a terrifying idea that. You know, something as superficial as your, as your face or your name can, can turn you into an authority in the eyes of the media sometimes. Yeah. When you uh, look at the success of Remains of the Day, the book and the movie, most of your books, including this one especially, do not necessarily lend themselves to a movie. Remains of the Day was made by Merchant Ivory into a very successful and much admired movie. Were you surprised? Yes, I was in a way, because every time I write a book, in a sense, I'm trying to write an unfilmable book. <laughs> now, this might sound perverse, particularly to, from a professional point of view, but as a novelist, I feel that if I'm offering an experience that can be more or less replicated in the cinema or in front of a television screen, then it's not really worthwhile, because it's so much easier to go to the cinema. You know, so it's, it's so much better fun. You know, <laughs> so what do you do to make sure it's not easily adaptable to well, another medium? I'm not just trying to make it not adaptable. I'm trying to find the territory that, that a no only a novel can offer. Uh, you know, I want to say, if you want this kind of experience, you can only get it in fiction. It's not, some kind of, it's not like a film on paper. Uh, and, and for this reason, I suppose I'm trying to create worlds that are very interior. Um, I'm trying to do things with, uh, with, with reality and time and space in this book that, that perhaps would not be easily done in film. But nevertheless, you see, the, the trouble for me is that there are, uh, there are all these very talented filmmakers around. And every time I think I've done an unfilmable book, as I, which is what I believe that remains to the day, because it was all interior monologue. You know, you, you get people like James Ivory and brilliant actors like Anthony Hopkins coming along, and they somehow 
turn all those w words inside a man's head into, into images. How different screen. was their interpretation from yours? I thought in essence they were, the, uh, the essence was, you know, uh, was the same. You know, the, I think the, the, the main kind of point, if you like, uh, that came out of, the, out of the book and out of the film were the same. Uh, I think the moods, the atmospheres were different. And I've got used to this idea that um, there are two things called the remains of the day. I mean, I, uh, you know, there's something called James Ivory's The Remains of the Day, which is a, a distinct and separate work from my remains of the day. And I, you know, it's, I admire his The Remains of the Day. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I think, yeah. it, uh, you know, I don't think of it like a translation of my book, as I would two regard the French. Two separate works of art, so to speak. I think that's how you have to look at it, because, you know, I think the movie has its strength and strengths and weaknesses, and my book has strengths and weaknesses. Well, then has anybody offered to buy this? Not so far, but I mean, now <laughs> well, it's being so you published. Must be a happy man. Say, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> well, as I say, the business You've side of me. You've succeeded, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Well, I have this kind of cat and mouse game with the film thing. You know, yeah. the business side of me makes me wish that, yes, yeah, somebody will make a big movie out of it. Not much sex, not much plot. There's, there's a bit of sex between two very old people, which uh, perhaps isn't the right sort of sex for a movie. But uh, I find that idea sex between two people who love each other but are decrepit, you know, touching and sad and moving. And uh, Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's perhaps the first uh, sex scene I've actually published. I, I think it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and was it something you wanted to, or was the subject of the relationship between two older people just presented itself and demanded that there be, you know, a dealing with this? Yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the latter. You yeah. know, I, I, don't, I don't approach... Um, my work in terms of saying, well, it's time we had a... Not so much that, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, uh, clearly in an evolution of a writer or a filmmaker, you go from saying, um, you know, I'd like to try this, and writing mm -hmm. about relationships, whether they be sexual or, or intellectual, has yeah. to mm -hmm. do with, you know, the normal evolution exploration of a playwright or a writer. Mm. You know, I mean, all of us want to do and try different things that mm. perhaps we haven't tried in the past, yes? Mm. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, th I think I certainly... There were a number of things I wanted to try for the first time in writing this book, but All probably right. sex wasn't one of them. Okay, but then what were they? Because that's what I'm getting at. Well, uh, I wanted to try writing right away from reality, to try and create a world that operated by its own alternative set of laws. Away from reality. Yeah. yeah. Mm. My first three books, you know, although they're interior monologues, basically they, they're realistic Grounded books. in reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted here to create a world that operated by different rules altogether. Um, and the other thing, much more s simply, I wanted to have a go at the longer novel, because I actually Yeah, this think is much longer than anything you've done. This is, what, 650? What is it? 600? It's 530, 530 pages or something page. like right, that. Right. So I think the longer novel is, uh, is a different form. I think there's, there's as much difference between the 250-page novel and the 500-page novel as there is between the short story and the, and the shorter and, novel. And what's I, the difference? Well, I think organically it, it works in a different way. You know, the, the, I, think, I think there are many differences, but the most basic one is I think shorter novels, on the whole, tend to just be like one story plus maybe a subplot. Whereas the longer form, you, you're talking about two, three, four narrative strands that, that, that are interlaced and, and orchestrated together. So, you know, it's as different as a sonata to a symphony. Are you part of a group in Europe, say? You know, that in a sense signal the coming back of the novel or, or a new appreciation of the novel or any of that? Well, I think the novel always seems to be coming back. I know, uh, it is. It's, it's always true. being written Either off that or, then, or it's dying. Yeah, it's always other. dying and then, yeah, then yeah. coming back. So, um, I mean, so I don't they know. have I mean, learned seminars on the death of the novel. Yes, it's been going on for you know, hundreds of years, the death of the novel. But uh, um, I, I don't belong to any kind yeah. of conscious group. I don't get, get around a table with bunch no, of I people and not plan anything. Yeah. What are your ambitions then? Well, as I've got older, is before I used to have diverse ambitions. You know, I, I always wanted to do a bit more kind of work in movies because you know, yeah. I've always been on the fringes of, of the film world, you know, uh, trying the odd script here and there. And so you've tried your hand at... at yeah, I've, been, I, I've tried to write movies. And in fact, James Ivory kind of persuaded me to have a go at writing screenplay r right now. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm really struggling with it. It's, it's a very an different An original form. screenplay or an adap adaptation? It's, it's kind of halfway between the yeah, two. Okay. He's, he had some materials. And, um, it's a very different form, and, uh, but I find the world of movies you know, fascinating. 
not least because I find the whole business world of movies fascinating. So I kind of like to hang well, around. What do you it. find fascinating about the business well, of movies? Maybe I only find it fascinating because I don't have a real investment in it. You know, but yeah, you see a lot there. You see a lot of people trying to keep some kind of hope alive that their project will get some funding. And, yeah. and you see all these people who are desperately wanting to be celebrities. And you yeah. see celebrities who are hounded by fame. And, and you, see, you see the maturation process of a film taking so many years. Yeah. I mean, you'll see this film's coming out in the Christmas 1995. And you talk to the filmmaker, and they say, well, we had our first script in 1987. Mm. Well, sometimes it's longer than that, you know. I mean, it's uh, and some films seem to be being in a gestation period for 20, 30 years. But back to your ambition. So your interest, you used to be interested in exploring film. Are yeah, you less no, so now? Well, I, I, it's something to do with hitting 40. I've suddenly got a little desperate. I realized <laughs> I, had to, I had to get down and consolidate the one thing I've been allowed to do, yeah. which, is, which is to write. I mean, you know, I used to want to be a musician. I wanted to be a filmmaker and a, and a writer. Uh, but I, I, I'm now kind of sticking to writing because I think I realize that there's only a limited amount yeah. of time left. And, um, and me and writing, well, it was never my great passion, but it's what I've been allowed to do. And it's a little like an arranged marriage. You know, uh, yeah. I was going after, uh, uh, I wanted to be a rock and roll star first, yeah. you know. And I, I was after all these other things, but life permits you to do something. I, I was fixed up with writing. and. Like in the range. Well, no, well you yeah. fixed up in a, a, a. Well, see, but that's what's troubling about that is if you were fixed up in writing rather than you found that writing was where your talent was and where your skill was and where your. Well, maybe passion they, uh, was. Well, maybe there's a bit of both, you know. But mm -hmm. I don't really see all these diff these things being that different. Now, I, I, f I feel uh, I do have certain things I want to do. And. Like. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say I could do, do it just as well in a musical form or in the movies. But, you know, if, if somebody said, you know, uh, I couldn't write any more books, but I, I was, for some reason I'd be transformed into a technically competent film director, you know, I, I feel uh, I could in some way just continue my career. Sure. You know? Yeah, but I mean, what about taking, I mean, why, would you be willing to say, I mean, it seems to me you're saying I'm, I've, I've reached 40. I realize that I'm a writer. You know, I mean, and I see this in other people you talk to on this program where, you know, they say, I, even athletic coaches will say, I realize I'm a lifer, that this is what I do. Mm. You know, I'm an athlete, I'm a coach, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a television journalist. I'm, you know, because as we grow older, we have all kinds of ambitions from being a Nobel laureate to being president to being, you know, to being a movie star to being a, a whole range of things. And somehow, I mean, was this a middle age crisis for you or was this just a middle age kind of? realization that this is what I am and I better make the best of this and see how far I can take it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more that. It's not a crisis because, because I mean, if you, if, you, if you have to settle on something, I mean, yeah. to, to settle on the idea that you're a novelist isn't so bad. I mean, it doesn't close down a lot of things. You know, you can still have this ambition of being a Nobel Prize winner. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. It's not as though it closes things down. But, but you see, I, I, I came to the conclusion that, I mean, you mentioned athletes there, that, that actually novelists often tend to peak only a few years after athletes. There's a kind of a myth going around that, you know, novelists Novelists peak. get better with age. Yeah, I, well, their, their prestige gets, to, I think, peaks when they're about 60 or 70. That's when they get a lot of awards and people yeah. are very but, but polite to them. But their performance peaks when? I think uh, somewhere around 35 to 45. I mean, this is proven <laughs> if you actually... You know what you're saying? that your best work is behind you. Yeah, I know. This is, this is terrifying. I mean, there are always exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> but if you make a list of you know, great classics and then try and find out how old the authors were when yeah. they actually it's wrote It's scary, them. isn't it? Yeah, it's scary. I mean, like Faulkner is a good example. Gets a Nobel Prize in his 60s for work he did in his early 30s. Yeah. Well, some people, critics, speaking of that, look at this and they have said, I don't quite get it, you know, and I don't know whether it's great or whether this is an aberration that was worthy but just doesn't cut it. And they mention Faulkner as, as an example of that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what, Do you, you consider mean, this an aberration? Do you consider <laughs> this taking big chances? Do you consider this you've gone off on the limb and maybe, you know? Well, I felt, I mean, at this point, you know, around the 840 mark, you, yeah. you've got to go for it. <laughs> yeah. There's no point in writing sort of pleasant things that, will, that are, you know, likely to, almost certain to attract nice reviews. I mean, you've got to go for it um, if you're going to be ambitious.
Kazuo Ishiguro, Remains of the Day, was his last book made into an award-winning film. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Wendy Wasserstein is here. Stay with us. <laughs>